Hey everyone, welcome to another deep dive. Today, super excited, I have Lewis. Lewis is from Gyroscope. Thanks for joining. Hey. Pleasure, great to be here. Yeah, so we can kind of just kickstart, you know, Gyroscope is, I guess you would say a stable coin, but it's it's a lot bigger than that. Uh, how did you find yourself building a stable coin? So Gyroscope is certainly a stable coin. Uh, it's a project with lots of other components that have emerged through uh, through the years. So the story started in 2018 or 19. Uh, I attended one of the first sort of PhD meetups in London where it was like a research meetup. Um, and so I was doing a PhD focused on DeFi um, at Imperial College. And uh, yeah, I went to one of these meetups and met this guy called Araya, Clarks Month. Uh, who was at the time, I think the only other person who's really interested in stablecoin design, at least in the sort of um, academic world. We started talking about what could make for a better stablecoin design. Uh, and also around that time, Balancer uh, version one was released or had sort of been out for just a short period. We started to think about like how a new, how a new stablecoin could be built that was like more robust and was like built on the um, these like self balancing pools that Balancer had constructed. So yeah, that, it feels like a long time ago now, but that was the that was like the very beginning of of the project. Um, and then uh, yeah, since then we um, yeah we sort of went on to. Uh, grow out a like development company um and the uh, everything became uh sort of you know, entities and became officialized and so on starting from about 2021 slash two um so yeah the yeah i sent a burning question yeah well i mean 2018 you you kind of you were really early because like what was what was around in 2018 it was like just die right it was it was just I. Um, I think, yeah. I mean, there have been others. Um, I think through the years, I've seen and written and been involved in many presentations uh, looking at charts of crashed stable coins. Um, it's uh, been for for a long time, and especially after the sort of collapse of um, like the algorithmic stablecoin as an idea. Um, it. Like, I think the stablecoin space has really like just needed to kind of mature and reflect the I just reflect some basics. I think it's it's not even it's not even that like the reasons that many of them crashed. It's like not like it was a very coherent mechanism that you know uh, just had some unlucky flaw. It was just like from the beginning, obviously a terrible idea. Um, so. So yeah, there were many, many, uh, many explosions. But yeah, back in 2018, Dai was indeed the first. Yeah, well, the, that was the main one. In fact, Dai was actually um, like looking at the maker ecosystem and Dai and these like CDPs. That was really what um, got me really interested personally in in like DeFi and uh, like looking at these different economic mechanisms and how. These could be built on chain. Um, my personal background before doing all of this was in economics. So I'd like like worked uh, worked in the city in London as an economist. I'd like done a like done my masters and all of these uh, qualifications up to that point in economics, more or less. So I was very interested in these like economic type questions and yeah, um, like the maker ecosystem with Dai provided like a lot of stuff to look at. And um, one of the earliest papers I wrote about was uh, on these liquidation mechanisms in, in Dai and how this could uh, could potentially go wrong. Super cool. Yeah, no, I, I remember that period well. Um, but yeah, let, let's get started. We can, we can just kind of dive in. How does gyroscope sort of work? I mean, I, I guess we can start with the stable coin and then we can move into some of the other connected pieces. If that works, sir. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds good. So, okay. So it, the main point about the gyroscope stable coin is that it is a reserve backed stable coin. 
So it has a reserve where the reserve is intended to be um, 100% collateralizing the stablecoin supply. So for every unit of GYD, there's supposed to be uh, at least a dollar of capital in the reserve. Okay, so we'll, let's start here. We'll start with uh, we'll start with Joe, the users, um, or I guess these would be the depositors. And yeah. they, they would put in what I guess backs GYD. Would it be yeah. ETH or it's usually a basket of things, correct? Uh, yeah, so it it can be a variety, it can be a few different assets. Um, depends on what the reserve supports. So, like a basic one would be what USDC, USDT, or uh, yeah, yeah, we we support like uh, assets of that of that type, yeah. Or I mean, what's what's the main one? I guess people would put in. What's the main system collateralized? Um, so at the moment, um, it's mainly like SDI. Oh, okay. Yeah. So SI, and then they put it in, and then it would go into the reserve over here, right? Yeah. Would be reserve that would have all of these stable coins out. This would, and this would have all of the different assets, correct? So, yeah. It would just be SDC, SDI. And do you only take? Stables as collateral, or can you take anything? So at the moment, it's just stable coins. Yep. Um, I hear that there's a, or that sounds like you're planning on more. <laughs> <laughs> well, I so I mean, I, I'm trying, I'm trying to, I'm trying to give like very accurate answers because because uh, everything's being drawn. But essentially, the the reserve um, itself. Uh, comprises like this logic where it can be essentially any token type can be supported okay. by it in different vaults. So maybe we'll, one thing to well, so yeah, it, so it can support any to, any token type, including um, I mean, yeah, theoretically it could support like volatile tokens. Although um, we can get into what that's about here. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean the the issue the issue with with just taking volatile tokens is obviously like this you know this is like the whole issue around like how do you make sure that there's actually enough collateral? So it's definitely not um it's definitely not well it's definitely not something we support at the moment, and um it could be something that's supported in like a in a small proportion, like depending on like you know what governance chooses and what seems safe and so on. Um, but this might be a good moment to just. Um, make one thing very clear about the reserve, which is that the reserve is actually these different vaults that, yeah, so that that sort of blob, it's these different vaults that are like separate from each other. Um, so at the moment, um, we've, we've got like four main vaults. Um, and they're selected so that the like assets in the different vaults, um, like, Kind of stratify like risk in the reserve so we don't want um certain types of risk being able to kind of propagate through the reserve in the very beginning of this project it was called the like an all-weather reserve and i think that we were the first stablecoin project to really be talking about an all-weather reserve they've become a, sort of a bit more talked about now but the main like design idea is to diversify risk as much as we can um, in how the reserve is composed. So like we, we want assets that are not all going to experience the same like uh, price risk or regulatory risk or geographic risk, uh, oracle risk and so on. So this is something that we like the composition of the reserve, like which assets are in it, we expect that that's going to change a lot as like governance votes in and out different vaults. At the moment, the reserve has been um, sort of kickstarted with with four main uh, four main vaults. And then what are those vaults? Like so, uh, at the moment, they um, they contain the the biggest is SDI. Um, we also have a um, like a USDC vault, 
um, we have a USDT vault, uh, and then we have a final vault that is that contains shares in our um, one of our AMMs. So this is like ECLP. Um, so yeah, maybe we should get back to that part later because it might uh, might sort of lead to a confusing explanation. But that's sure. yeah, that's sort of how it's structured. Okay, so then you have the, the separate vaults. So I, I think this should make sense to people. So basically, people would be you have depositors over here, and then you would have say users who would actually be here, and, and these are the people that want the stable coin, right? So they they would be able to withdraw from the system. What is it? GUID USD, right? Or, yeah. or I guess that would be the people depositing. Or so what? yeah. How so for, for how would somebody get it? So for a depositor, um, well, the way that we there are kind of two main actions you can perform. So one is minting, and one is redemption. So minting is where you um, go to the smart contracts in the reserve. Um, and you uh, deposit um, assets um, into the reserve, but it's not really like deposits, not really the right word to use because it's like, so just to make it one point, hopefully makes, makes this super clear is that um, it's really just like a swap, like the assets, like for example, SDI um, um, or USDC, um, they go into the reserve and the user gets in exchange GYD. Yep. Um, and they get they get the amount um, that depends on just like how much dollar value they've put in. So this is like really different to something like DAI, where um, at least like the, the CDP parts of DAI, which are like debt-based. So, right. so this is this is more of like an AMM based in, in a way. Or, or... Um, it, I it's well, I wouldn't say that it's it's more like um, so there's so the protocol like owns the um, reserve in gyroscope um, as as the like reserve assets, but you but it has this like property that like the the user is not getting themselves into these like positions of debt. They're just swapping assets in and getting GYD out. Um, that on the minting side, um, for redemption, um, it's the opposite. So the user can take their GYD and they can go to the reserve and they can uh, redeem the GYD for um, whatever the dollar equivalent would be in in like underlying assets. Yep. So I mean, it, it sounds AMME, right? <laughs> in in some ways. So this this guy up here will send GYD and he'll get back collateral. So like, because the idea usually with like you know like LUSD or DAI or something like that, with a debt position is you'd have to deposit say 110 percent worth of collateral and then you get back 100. You know, if you deposit 110 dollars worth of the collateral, you get back 100 dollars worth of LUSD, for instance. Uh, but that's not how this works here, correct? Yeah, I can see the parallel, and like we do, we there are we use um, like we use AMMs extensively, and also have built some for other parts of the protocol. Um, I guess you could, I, I, depending on like how you kind of think of an AMM, it's like sort of doing that, but but it's like um, it's I think easier to just think of it as um, oh, those are some pretty amazing visual effects that just popped up. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's. I think. I think it's just easier to think of it as like this diversified like bank of different like the different smart contracts that contain like each vault is like a particular smart contract that contains these funds, um, and then minting means like funds go from the user into the reserve, and redemption is the is the reverse. So um, when you deposit collateral, if you're depositing SI, for instance. Yeah. I didn't know how much GYD to give you. Right. So um, this is through a mechanism that is called the dynamic stability mechanism. This is something that we built, and there's um, there's a like 
fully detailed explanation of that um, somewhere on uh, YouTube um, that was given at DevCon last year. But um, to just to just like explain the kind of main points about it. So what it does is essentially it defines the price. So given an input collateral basket, it says like for this collateral, how many uh, like how many GYD should be minted and in the opposite direction, it's like, okay, I want to redeem this number of GYD. How many US dollars worth of collateral should I get out? Um, right. The, this is all... Contract, right? The main contract, I guess, that people are interacting with is the DSM? Um, yeah, it's not exactly the main... So, yeah, it sort of is, but it's not like the main, main contract of the whole system mm -hmm. is this contract that we call the motherboard. Um, sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that that's like the that's like the kind of spine, I suppose. But then um, the DSM is is a, a separate smart contract that uh, people uh, like. It gets invoked during a minting or redemption operation, essentially, and someone can uh, that like, it's used to determine the 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 gyd that is to be redeemed um so and this would be so based on I'm, I'm guessing how much is in each vault right if you're if you have like because i'm guessing you have governance and it sets say like 25 percent across each vault is the target right or um, yeah, actually, uh, so as an aside, like at the moment, the vaults aren't set to like 25, 25, 25. Um, the percentages, uh, I think I've got them, uh, got them in front of me, actually. So it's like uh, we've got something like 58% on, on SDI um, and like about 18%, 18 12 and 12 or so for the other assets, but just, yeah, just as, a, as an aside. That's um, not You'll have to explain the numbers. It's <laughs> I need yeah. to number like fifty-eight. <laughs> yeah, and it's so like the the sort of development company that has created the, this like first version. We've kind of calibrated something that is what we think um, like represents like a good balance of risks, but what like these percentage weights so these percentages i just gave you are like these target weights okay. and um there's there's this logic um when when minting or redeeming there's this logic in a smart contract that enforces that a minting or redemption operation won't kind of push the the, the value too far away from these target weights yep so, like if, you're, if you're depositing SDI for GYD, it'll look, and if you're already at say fifty nine percent SDI here, it'll yeah. give you it'll give you a bad price, right? Um, it won't give. So that's right overall, but it won't give you a bad price. It actually just won't let you do it. Oh, um, <laughs> yeah. It 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 won't. Um, it won't let you push the reserve like beyond these like some some bounds so there's the there's this like target target weight there's then this like band that's acceptable around that weight and then um yeah like if if you if the user is about to do something that will push the reserve like outside of that band yeah. then it's just not the operation is not allowed um there are like yeah when I, i'm talking about this like i have in mind like many sort of small caveats to what i'm saying but because it depends on like, you know, re redemption, if it's rebalancing is okay and so on. Um, but it's all everything, like the entire logic of this rebalancing is like all in like public smart contracts. Um, so there's no, there's no like, there's no magic about how, how it's done. Um, and I think it's totally enough to just talk about this like main intuition that the smart contracts tries to keep the reserve at the target weights. Well, this is you know, like you, you actually have a really good paper that explains this um, kind of like the problem with a, a lot of stable coins, like, you know, like M stable or, or 
not, not to pick on them, but you know, like the, the idea of like, if you just had a basket, so like, well, the stable point is back by these three and you make them fungible. The problem is always like, if one of them rugs, it just drains the collateral in, in all of the other ones. Right. And that, that's like the big risk of like the diversifying stable point risk is, is you basically get the worst of any of them. Yeah. In, in most of these systems, whereas for here, it seems like since you obviously can't trade it within a band, even if USDC rugs and there's giant regulatory risk, your GYD will go down a little bit, but not hopefully gone. Yeah, exactly. That's that's really like the main this 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 part about these different reserve weights. So like this is the whole this is like the whole main point of the design. Yep. Um, so it's like we we had this analogy at the beginning, which um, I I think it's actually it's quite good as an image. Um, it's definitely uh, an ill advised reference for me to continuously make, but I'll I think it's just so clear that I'll just repeat it. Like we. The, um, like if you think of the Titanic, um, <laughs> the, the Titanic, like the main reason um, it sank uh, after after hitting the iceberg was that these like different um, bulkhead doors in the in the ship, like they they didn't kind of go all the way to the ceiling, um, so the like water kind of spilled over from like compartment to compartment, and like this kind of it wasn't contained, and um, and the ship sank, and the the idea here is to uh like not do that so you sort of have like these uh have these compartments so that they're like sealed off from each other um to like the extent that um that's possible which is to a quite a great extent and then it just then it just confines the risk to certain things so you might lose like you know one bulkhead something might happen but you know compared to um compared to a ship that's like uh I don't know, like USDC only, you would much rather have this like confined to some portion and have other assets um, in there that kind of allow it to float. I think I mix that up as much as I possibly could, that explanation uh, with the with the uh, analogy. But uh, that's, yeah, that's the idea. It's like have these doors go all the way to the ceiling. Yes, stable coins and titanics. So usually you don't want to, to mix the references there. <laughs> you, you know, it is... It, on a certain level, I do totally see that's an awful idea, but it does <laughs> but, make the design clear. Yeah. Um, well, and then obviously the next question in my mind would be, how do you sort of price these vaults? You know, like if you have SI, you can assume that SI is worth a dollar, USDC is worth a dollar, USDT is worth a dollar. <laughs> yeah. And obviously that doesn't affect, you know, you can't always assume they're a dollar or it's it's wrong. Or it right. could be in the case of a collapse. So I guess how how do you sort of say what percentage they're at? Um, so so what happens is that we have like essentially the protocol needs to be aware, and these individual vaults like they need to be aware of um, what the like um, prices are, like the dollar prices of the assets in the reserve. So and this is also like. Uh, certainly, as you guys are well aware, like the like oracles are like a really like critical part of um, of DeFi and crypto infrastructure, and they're also quite like they can be quite fragile as well. So, like there are lots of um, different trust assumptions that can come in depending on like you know how your like protocol works, where it takes data from, and we've seen like so many hacks where um there's essentially been some like manipulation of an oracle that's then allowed some action specifically with like you know flash loans and oracles have really been a um pretty sort of nasty combination for attacks um so so what we did was we built this mechanism called the consolidated price feed which um this essentially is um, an entirely on-chain system that performs like different checks on prices to try to make sure that the prices are like robust the the, the system is using. Um, so there's like when 
when a user like does a minting operation, for example, the assets that are being like input into the reserve, they um, they get they get priced, and this is done um, like via a call to this like consolidated price feed. Um, the function is called something like checked price oracle. It's like some batch operation. And it does like all of yeah. yeah I won't, won't go into that level of detail, but it does like all of this. Uh, it does this like batch. Um, check of the prices and um there are like two main aspects to that price check so the first is that we do these like relative price checks so we take um we take like the price of let's say eth in wrapped bitcoin um from chain link and we compare that price that relative price to different AMMs that are allowing people like on chain to swap from um ETH to wrapped Bitcoin. So, so like ETH USDC, ETH SDA, ETH USDT and make sure it's all so, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. We we check we check these we check these like relative prices, but we have this like set of assets and you can do this like kind of N choose two like comparison of like how how many relative prices you want to check so but yeah the main thing with these relative checks is is comparing like is is comparing these uh on like chain link relative prices um to the amm on chain prices um and then so these are like the relative checks and then and then we have this like um sort of absolute price check or um we sometimes call this like price level check where we're looking at like the the um eth usd price um because like yeah there aren't like on on chain like native on chain sources for like eth usd because usd is not on chain um right. so we we do these this like these price level checks um and that's um that involves like taking other, that's like another type of cross-referencing um, where rather than cross-referencing like chain link to, to um, AMM prices on chain, we cross-reference um, like ETHUSD specifically against um, other prices reported on chain. So one is actually from Teller um, and also um, like we use like Coinbase sign prices as well. Um, Yep. And then the sort of combination of these absolute and relative checks um just like me it, they sort of if they if they sort of pass if there's no inconsistency raised in the oracle system during like a, a mint or redemption then we're pretty confident that we the, or the protocol is pretty confident that it like knows the sort of real price of these assets um and then it's able to um then it's able to like go ahead and 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 deposit the assets in the different vaults, um, and um, yeah, and then issue the GYD to the user. Cool. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, you guys have a really robust oracle mechanism. I mean, so what happens? I guess what would happen in the case that it comes back and the level checks don't pass, like things are all wacky for some reason. Yeah, so um, it it depends. Like, I'm yeah, I'm really trying hard not to say it depends, but it does depend on <laughs> like a few things. Uh, so a few like there are a few kind of parameters that are set up in the protocol. Um, but essentially, if like like if the at a high level, like if the protocol is not sure what's going on, it's it's quite dangerous to. Um, it's like it's it's quite dangerous to essentially allow certain operations. Um, so uh, it will, in the most common case, like revert. Um, so it just freezes and, the contract in some ways until the, uh, the yeah the contract's not frozen, but um, it would um, it would not allow like 
if if there was no pricing um like minting would not be like you'd have to wait until like prices were updated um for like for redemption um the treatment's like a little bit different like we don't we don't want to um ever like stop redemptions from happening um but yeah it really like like it's um for me to like I, I don't want to give just like a kind of partial version of this because it depends it depends quite a lot on like exactly how the smart contracts are configured. I think it might be might be a bit of a sort of bit of a headache going through all of all of that right now. Um, yeah, because I mean, like the risk here would be like, let's say USDC depends because they, the, you know, like the whatever the the last crisis yeah. this year. Um, all the reserves and the treasury determines it's illegal. USDC is now worth zero. So obviously the, the link ETH pool or the level, the link ETH pool would come back that this is gone. You know, all the ETH is run. And, and then no one could basically, you would basically limit then depositing of USDC or would, would it affect the other one, deposits or would it just be? Oh, so this is like, if in your scenario, this would be, this would still, everything would still operate as normal in, in our system. Um, uh, it's like the, the thing with the Oracle system is just like, can the, uh, like, is it sure about the prices? Um, so if it's sure that like the, the price is like off peg, then, um, the, then like there are like the oracle system itself won't kind of return any errors um the there are other parts of the system that will um like prevent like some assets being deposited or some being withdrawn like depending on like if a if a stable coin um is like totally off peg for example um but yeah this is like done on a like case like case by case is an asset by asset, not not occurrence by occurrence um, basis. Uh, and again, it's like all like there is no like kind of magic or anything behind the scenes about how it's done. It's just all in smart contracts. Um, right. So we, you know, define like ceiling and floor prices for different assets and just enforce certain. Um, yeah, like just certain things have to be true in order for minting or redemption to happen. Super cool. Um... Yeah, no, I mean, I, I love it because, like, most of the time we have the opposite problem with Oracle users in that they, like, they're, like, we'll just take an SIUSD price and let us know. <laughs> and they, like, don't really think it out, whereas you guys are, like, I have actually thought of the Oracle piece. So, like, thank you very much for considering yeah. that. Um, yeah, because, like, you know, that's it, it's a robust Oracle mechanism, actually, which is cool. Um, yeah. I the Oracle, I I find Oracle is just terrifying to be honest. It's, it's there's yeah. it's super fragile um, as just like by like the just the 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 attempts that's being made to import like off chain data is something that really needs like you know needs to be like very robustly done and that's why well yeah you know better than I do about like how to make them robust but it's like it's really important to dedicate like significant amount of thought if, if you're building a protocol to how how you use oracles because it's uh very very easy for that to be a, a weak point in the code if you're not doing things um sensibly well and kind of like we were getting through at the beginning this this piece would probably be the big risk in bringing on long tail assets right like you can't price them in any way so you know we're, we're dealing with some people with lending protocols and if you, right. know, if you need to bring on some shit point that only, only trades on curve or something like that. It's yeah, yeah, exactly. Gets really, really risky. Um, all right, so cool system. I, yeah, so so that's that's like so what we've talked about now is the main sort of stablecoin logic, but there's one like the kind of big uh piece that like hasn't that we've not talked about at all um which are the AMMs that we built yeah um so 
and actually this picture is quite nice because uh it i i can uh hopefully kind of link it so you see this like vault four you have this gyro amm yes that one yeah that's the one so so that is actually an eclp so e is like elliptical yep. um and so what like what we wanted from the beginning was we wanted that around the peg the gyd um against like stable coins other stable coins we wanted a lot of liquidity but like tight to the peg um and so these eclps um they are uh, they're, they're just like amms um so they support like two assets so um, like you do a gyd asset pair for instance yeah, that's that's an example. Yeah, um, but we've we've got quite a f like there are quite a few GYD uh, sorry quite a few ECLPs out there now, uh, and they support all sorts of assets. So it's not just um, it's not just like GYD against something. It's um, like it can be like wrap state ETH against ETH or like all sorts of pairs. Um, and actually, just what, because you've just drawn that on this picture, one thing I want to make really clear is that like GYD itself is not like in the reserve. So like the this gyro AMM um, that doesn't that doesn't contain GYD. Um, so at the moment that that uh, the AMM that we have is like LUSD and Curve USD. Um, but yeah, there's no sort of recursion. Um, Wow. Yeah, but so these. So where where do you leverage the ECLPs? Then is it is that in Vault Four? Is like leveraging ECLPs. So the so the where the ECLPs come in is like on the secondary market for GYD. Okay. Yep. So what they do is like because they use an ellipse, they allow the liquidity to be like the profile of liquidity to be calibrated like very tightly to like actual like trading ranges. So um, at the moment, like there's um, like, we're doing a lot of different calibration exercises for like particular pairs to kind of shape the liquidity in an ECLP to, um, to like where it's traded. And because it's because it's an ellipse, like the it can be asymmetrically ca like calibrated, so it doesn't just have to be symmetric. Yeah. And this this means that like compared to compared to other um, AMMs, it's like the the fact it can be asymmetric means that it's very like very capital efficient. So a lot of liquidity in these ECLPs gets concentrated to the range that things actually should be traded um right. so yeah if i maybe step back just a bit so like eclps are we built them because we wanted to be able to like define these like primary market quotes for gyd like on the primary market being like where it's minted and redeemed and then we wanted the eclps to be like on the secondary market kind of filling in between between these like minting and redemption prices and and having this like super liquid stable coin around the peg in the middle. Um, right. So kind of like this red line, you know, this is sim correct me if I'm wrong, they're similar to like curve pools where you've, you've modified, basically mm -hmm. narrowed the curve a lot of ways. So there's like, we, there are some, like similarities, but the, I think the main thing is that um, they're like, a, 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 a lot more customizable. I think compared to like stable swap, it's like uh, something like seventy. I think it's like two or five percent more capital efficient. Um, and so, yeah. So and like these ECLPs have this like primary. Like the reason we built them was for the secondary market for GYD. But at the same time, um, they're super useful for just other pairs. And that's we've seen a. Um, quite a bit of like uptake of using ECLPs for like particular uh, particular trading pairs at the moment. Um, be a good example of of something with say like 
you know, very narrow on the downside, long, long on the upside or something like that with one of these asymmetric curves? Yeah. So, I mean, we've, um, we've implemented or like calibrated these ECLPs for, um, quite a bit of like LST use. Um, so that's like one of these cases where like you, like in the, in the original version of the ECLPs, um, like they were like with LSTs, like you can be fairly sure about like the kind of the, the like say peg being maintained. Um, so, um, it was like quite like the, the use case was like quite clear for ECLPs, like for these LSTs. Um, we've done like other, like kind of custom calibration for like other, like particular liquidity profiles. Um, so, um, there's a newish pool, um, for like go against USDC. Um, we've also got, um, I think there was. Uh, another sort of we've had other recently deployed pools uh, like S Frax against GYD as well. Um, so it's yeah, like typically it's like a kind of the calibration process is like quite um, yeah, quite sort of involved. Looking at like historical data, trying to work out like wh what like the profile should be, and then and then going going with that. I mean, how much of it, I guess, is looking at the, the past trading versus just like using your economist thinking to say like, you know, this may trade, you know, like, because like Stake Teeth, for instance, is a really good example in that like everyone, everyone right now is saying like it's never going to trade below E or something like that. But DPEG events, like there, there obviously are slashing risks in there. So yeah. like. Yeah. Yeah. Um... Yeah, I mean, great question. Like, it's um, it's kind of a mixture. Like, the calibration is um, it's a it's a kind of funny exercise. Like, it's not like probably there's like no kind of objectively best calibration for a particular pair, um, and it's hard to be certain that the calibration that like that we settle on in the end like is um the like very best because you have to like bear in mind different trade-offs um but yeah it's essentially like it, it comes down to like some eyeballing working out what seems reasonable um and then and then just setting the smart contracts like with the with the like calibrated parameters so on on our on our app like you can see the liquidity distribution that the the, the ECLP uh sort of is is uh, is providing um and it's yeah also like any anyone can deploy these pools so it's not like um it's not like the kind of development company is like the only party that is able to deploy them um it yeah, it just it depends on uh, yeah, it's sort of asset pair by asset pair based. Um, and then so something to maybe just mention is that like uh, what I've talked about here are these like original ECLPs. Um, recently, we released these a new type of ECLP, which um, we've called this like rehype ECLP. Yeah. And so what that is, is an ECLP where the, the capital gets like rehypothecated um, to Arvo. So like a user deposits, um, let's say like USDC, um, that gets rehypothecated to Arvo, these like non-rebasing tokens go into the ECLP and then um, you're left with something that like allows like I mean I yeah sorry sorry for it to sound uh, like a like a sort of uh, sales pitch or whatever but it, I think it is actually just the most capital efficient AMM. Well I mean um, this is everybody's you know this is the whole Kind of like the whole idea of AMMs now, it's it's turning into how capital efficient can you be? And that's yeah. why you 
lot of, same with stable points, and that's why lots of people are putting say like step in there. Like yeah. why use teeth when you can use step and you get a return and then right. And now you're you're just basically taking it and then obviously the risk here is that if the Abe position goes bad, <laughs> you're you know, you, you could yeah. potentially lose money in there, correct? But yeah, but what so there was um so balancer had these boosted pools. Yeah. Um you probably remember that. Um like this provides like what we have provides the same like um the same like possibility for the user, but the design is completely different. So the the boosted pool architecture was like a kind of pool on top of pool model. Um what what we have instead here is like the the a lot of the kind of logic um is handled instead by the like smart order router within within balancer um so it's actually like the design itself is actually like it's like radically simplified compared to um the boosted pool design um and yeah it, it's you can think of like if you have these um the like non rebasing tokens that uh Arva has these like they, they have very long names it's like some static like static a usdc token sometimes with an n at the end um this like you can just deposit those tokens straight in our pools and you've like already done the kind of rehypothecation part yourself um obviously for the sort of user experience like we uh, like help with that so you can start with usdc and then this will get like swapped into the correct asset and then deposited um but the, the actual like logic behind the scenes is is um much simpler uh and right now it's, it's Abe. yeah can is this customizable can you pick which one you're like if i made a rehab pool could i pick where i want to rehab applicated um yeah not at the moment um <laughs> yeah would be would be great to support that at some point um we're just starting uh starting with one thing well because like the example i was thinking is that you could have like you could have like two different state deeds lsts in, in one of these eclps and then you could like rehypothecate it all like all the backing is just deposited in eigenlayer or something like that and you can Take yeah, out the um, yeah. In principle, that's possible. Um, yeah, we. I think we're just kind of. Yeah, I mean, I don't really have. We just haven't done. We just haven't done something like that yet. Yeah. Cool. Um. Yeah. Well, I mean, we're we're kind of coming up on time, but I think like you know, oh, in addition to GID USD, you guys also have a governance token that sort of votes on all of these parameters, correct? Uh, there, there, um, there will be one, sure. So we we have a an entirely on chain governance system. So yeah, lots of uh, lots of projects seem seem to like have stopped caring about like decentralized governance or like moving away from decentralization. Not really sure why that is. Seems like quite a profound mistake to me. So. The, yeah, we have entirely on-chain governance, um, and uh, which is like? sorry. Yeah, just what does that look like now? Yeah, so we're in this like bootstrapping phase of that. So the governance system uh, is like it's a bit like the elements uh, council system in some ways. That was like a part of the inspiration for it, and you know have. Uh, great things to say about the the element team, um, but we did build it um, like entirely from scratch ourselves. It's like different voting vaults. Um, so if you hold, um, if you so there are like a few different ways to get governance power. There's this like vaults if you have these like founding frogs, which are these like early users. Others for these like counselors of the protocol. Others for LPs. Um, so a lot like 
the idea is to have this like pluralistic governance system where um, you can have voting power, uh, um, not just through having funds at stake, but of course you also do want people with funds at stake to have voting power because they also have like, you know, skin, skin in the game, often a lot of skin in the game. And so, yeah, as part of this, there's also a, vo a voting vault that's for the um, the JIFI token, uh, which is the governance token. Um, and yeah, it's all like it's all on it's all on a front end. You can sort of see all of this architecture, um, and that is used to that is used to change the system. Um, so different vaults get voted in through governance, um, and yeah, it's like supposed to be entirely um, like on-chain governance. How, how has that gone? Are you pro DAO still, or yeah, I I I think it's it's gone well. Like we've we've had um, like the the project's community is uh, quite it's sort of been uh, growing for a long time. Like we started with this like very early testnet version of the protocol i think in like maybe even 2020 um yeah. and uh we've yeah i mean it's like we've got a discord of i don't know maybe like about fourteen thousand people um lots participating in like different discussions and also um many people um have minted these founding frogs so we went with a sort of frog themed version of uh, different kind of core influential figures uh, from the sort of history of the world, Amelia Earhart and others. Uh, so, so you can mint these frogs and yeah, I mean, quite a few thousand, I, I think maybe like 4,000, maybe 5,000 have been minted. Um, and um, yeah, it's, we're, we've also created this, uh, point system that has been running now for a, about like two weeks, which uh, is also part of the this like effort to um, bootstrap the the governance ecosystem. Um, so yeah, yeah it's, uh, it's, it's growing and it's a sort of uh, yeah very lively uh, Discord. Cool. Well, yeah, because I mean, you guys came from you. You guys are like an older project, and like it seems like you know back in. Four years ago, it was like all about DAOs, and now no one talks about DAOs. <laughs> um, yeah. It's like a dirty word, I guess, in in some ways, because no one is sort of no one likes them. But then everyone still does governance tokens, so it's it's cool. You guys are trying kind of a, a different model, at least, than just the straight up one token, one vote, which, which I like. Uh, cool. Okay, what did I miss before we wrap up? Is there anything? pressing that you know we we need to cover that you're like oh really miss this one um quite a question i uh i think there's nothing like nothing glaring i mean hopefully this has been like a helpful overview um For there sure. are of course like you know lots of sort of footnotes that i would make to some of the things i said about the um like the reserve assets and so on um um but no i think that's good i mean it's yeah it's been a pleasure to talk i hope uh i hope this has helped make things clearer yeah and, and to kind of like last question you know like you you've been around this space for a while um what have you learned about if you could talk to somebody who's building a new stable point or something like that like what have you learned building stable coins in DeFi throughout the years? Um, be like one one takeaway for for people who are watching. I think the main thing is that people only really care about risk once it starts to materialize. By which time it's normally too late. And I think like it's important to be like I think having this role that's like set kind of always talking about like the risks and risk and this sort of thing is not like it's not like the sort of sexiest role to have i think but it's um and you know nor like you know i don't personally have these kind of strong doomsday feelings about the world and how it's important to build up you know architecture that will exist sort of a billion years after human civilization dies out i'm also very much like pragmatic about about what's built but 
like infrastructure in in DeFi is like so much of it is built like very quickly, like quite badly, um, often by like some kind of like you know fifteen year old in a basement, and like we can just like do better than than that like so much of the time, um, and so yeah, I think. I, I do genuinely believe that like fundamentals of like risk are like um like the space, even if there are moments where it like doesn't seem to make much sense, it always corrects in a way that brings it into line with sort of you know re actual economic reality. For sure. No. Uh, well where where can people find out more? Uh where can people get involved? Um, well, I think the, the website is probably the best place. So the website is gyro.finance, and we've put a lot of effort into making sure the docs are clear. So docs.gyro.finance, there's a lot of information there. And then, yeah, just joining the Discord. Um, there's a lot of the uh, core team uh, present and answering questions all day long. So uh, it's a good place to get involved as well. Awesome. Yeah, super thanks for coming on, Lewis. Pleasure.